So thank you everybody for being here for our uh, meeting today uh, for CCMP Encore. Um, I want to start out by mentioning again for you, um, if you're a member of this class, and I, first off, I got to tell you up front, I don't know about the second class this summer, and the main reason is right now our CML license ends on the 20th of June, and I do not have any indication that they're going to extend that for us for this pilot. Um, and if that is not extended, then I'm not going to offer a class that I don't have some type of lab environment for. Um, so I, I'm in a I'm in a bind, folks, um, in in terms of ENS uh, A R or E N A R S I. Um, I want to get y'all the class. I want to give you the opportunity to take it. Um, we may even work something out where I just put you in the class and we all study and and we go from there. But we I don't have a good lab environment, so I'm not going to charge for the class. I will tell you this, I have some leftover funds and some of you've already asked to be put in one of these other classes uh, for the summer. If you are interested in one of these, uh, let me know and I will put you on the list. I got about 20 slots available uh, for instructors this summer uh, using funds that were left over from the Cisco grant in the spring. Uh, we did not spend every single dime of that money because of the, we had so many people registering and, and so much that we, uh, we ended up holding some back just in case we had uh, needed to run a class. I am not Definite currently. Go ahead. Uh, this uh, DevNet associate that you have for summer is the same as whatever we have right now, or yes. is different? Same class. Same, same class. class. Okay. Yeah, we Thanks. just run it. We run it every. Uh, we we we're going to run it every semester until people no longer want it. Basically. <laughs> it um, is excellent course. I, I really liked it. I did. And you'll notice here, I'm actually working on some Python stuff myself. Uh, you know, yeah. I've got a Udemy <laughs> Python class that I'm, I'm, I'm playing in. Um, so yeah, I definitely, uh, I, I, I like it a lot. I think it's a very yeah. good course. Um, yeah. it's, 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 uh, it's definitely not easy. Um, yeah. but it's, it's a great course. Um, yeah. but if you're interested in being in these, email me and I'll try to put you in one. Um, and again, your registration fee of 195.50 would be covered by our grant. Um, so uh, just it'd be like the spring, uh, you, you would have that covered for you. Um, and, and as soon as I know something about the CCMP, I'll let y'all know um, about the CML if we get it extended. I'm just, I'm not, uh, not right now comfortable uh, running it without some type of environment. I still, we still don't have the, uh, the physical environment up for for encore um which which bothers me um i really wanted to have that for you at this point but um uh, obviously i can't i can't make it myself so um well I, technically i could but it would it would be redoing all the work they're doing so um questions about that opportunity for the summer now also if you have let's say you've got all these you don't need any of these classes um you're prepped if you have another instructor at your school who is in your academy and would be teaching or going to teach these courses in the future, I would also be willing to give them access. One thing I do ask, you know, that for anybody taking CyRops Associate, they really need to have CCA one and two level knowledge at least before they take CyRops Associate, in my opinion, or have a networking background. If they have a networking background or understand or have been in cybersecurity for a long time, they, they will probably be okay. Um, DevNet really doesn't have any major uh, prerequisite. I do think knowing Python before you go in helps a lot. Would you not agree? Was it Ali talking about the class? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I think knowing Python going in would will help, but it's not a prerequisite at all. Um, but it, it's, a, it's a good class. So um, yeah, yeah. that's another exactly. exam I've got to try to take. Yeah. Go ahead, Ali. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. Yeah, here even I think chapter 27 and 20, uh, chapter 27 to 29 of this encore, it's going to overlap with those things. Yep. I yeah. agree. I agree yeah. completely. Yeah, they actually do overlap uh, a great deal. So yeah. I would like to know uh, do we have chance to work on those lab on chapter 27 to 29? I would like to. Well, Let's work do on them. The, let me do this and let me real quickly look at. I do believe, okay. actually, if unless I'm mistaken, let me let me go into here. Let me go. Uh, 
I'll show you what I've got. Um, and, and, and so let's go, come on, get in here. They find the labs themselves back. I don't know if we have a lab here. The pipe, basic Python script. Um, I tell you what I do have. Um, okay. All right. I have. I do have something here that's a little. That that this is one hundred percent beta. But we have worked with, uh, we've actually worked with Cisco and went out with Cisco with NDG. And I built this, I built this pod. Um, it's called the DevNet pod. And maybe you've used it some. You may not have Ollie because he's also having you download. But we have a DevNet pod. And in this pod is a, the PC. It's not this, it's not the CCNP VM, but it's got, a lot of it's got basically the same stuff on it and we've also mm -hmm. got a 1000 v so basically here's the client which is the devnet vm okay and then here's the 1000 v that's booting up um and so you technically should be able to do this lab in this pod okay. so i will enable this content in our um uh, in our class now it will not match exactly probably you're gonna have to play with it a good amount but it it should allow you to do it you should be able to actually okay. be able to do it um good enough think, thank you i would think a good amount because in fact i think this same lab is in uh devnet if i'm not mistaken i think this exact same lab is in the devnet class it um, could be so, we are not there yet yeah, I'm pretty sure it is. I'm, I'm actually yeah. almost 100% positive. But I will add this content to your class. Um, I really that appreciate way, it. That way you'll be able to at least play with it uh, and, and, <clears throat> and enjoy it. By the way, if you ever, I know y'all don't know, add content, but let's go in here and add uh, the DevNet pods. So there, that should actually let you now do Let's see if I can schedule that inside of my class. I got a chat here. Who's chatting with? Okay, three by three map pods. That'd be interesting to see if that would work with the if they. I'm just waiting, David, for them to get the lab, uh, the lab pods developed. I mean, that's that's my biggest problem is getting them to do that. It's a DevNet Labs. Open DevNet. There you go. All right, so you've got access to it now. Okay. Thank you. And like I said, it's just a single, it's a single, uh, the, it's literally the DevNet PC mm -hmm. and a 1000V and the 1000V should already have the configuration on it. Yeah, it has the base mm -hmm. configuration of uh, the 192. Nope, it did not. It didn't take the DH, didn't take the address. You had to physically put the IP address on it. Thought we had fixed that. After we pass basically this class, uh, we have uh, access to those content as an instructor. Is it correct? Correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, that's nice. David saying he's paralleling the labs on the 2911. Yeah, they should work. That should work fine. Uh, David, 2911 and 3560 should support the labs. Um, you just boot up all the devices and then use your, your ports as they as they as they exist in the lab, I would guess. Yeah, yeah and that's, that's what I've been doing. The um, I use the general connection of the, the map set. That was yep. the older one for like season A6. Yep. And it runs great so far. I haven't, of course, I haven't done all, all the labs, but right. uh, it's been good so far. In fact, it did the uh, virtual routing that was pretty slick on there. It was actually faster than what I could do in the uh, uh, CML lab. Yeah, so I, I would, I would, I'm sure it would be faster there because of because of that. Uh, I'm very interested, folks, in just quickly jumping in here. Uh, well, that may be an option, uh, David. We could we could figure out maybe figure out. Uh, 
some way to to use those if they would work. I need to we need to look to see for the next class, uh, get the labs and look at them and see if if that three by three pod would work. Um, so what I want to do, I'll just pull out. So we're saying, ah. Uh, My internet said it's going unstable. Can y'all still hear me? Let's let this boot and I'll come back to it. I want to look at that. Let's talk uh, folks a little bit about advanced OSPF. I'm not going to get through as much today as I wanted, um, but I want to talk about just multi-area OSPF and um, how it works. Now we all know that typically if you've only got a single area, all the routers will have a, an identical copy of the LSDB or the link state database. The problem is as your area grows, LSDB becomes too big. Uh, you also start having problems with, uh, you know, a link goes down, the entire environment has to go through um, a spanning tree, excuse me, a shorts path first, it has to go through and, and redo the entire shorts path for tree. Um, so if you get a flapping link, it can cause a large amount of problems uh, in an area, uh, especially a large area. So the concept of multiple areas allows you to break your network up so that um, you are able to control the size of that link state database. Now, area zero is required, period. Um, there's no ifs, ands, or buts. Also, uh, by design, all areas must connect to area zero. Now, there is a way around that. There's a thing called a virtual link that lets you um, have a connection back or appear to have a connection back to area zero. You also can do GRE tunnels and tunnels that are available. Uh, that's beyond the scope of this class. That's in the next class. But uh, the big thing is, by design, all areas must connect to area zero. The good thing about multiple areas, um, but and I know it says here it says in essence it hides the topology of one area from another. Now this is the bad example anyway, because they're not showing area zero. But um, the idea, it says, just because routers connect to multiple OSP areas does not mean the routes one area will be injected into another. However, by default, that is exactly what happens. Um, LSA type threes are uh, used by area border routers to move all of the networks in one area to another area. Um, so it doesn't have to be that way though. Uh, but by default, that typically is what happens. So, but area zero is a um, is a special area called the backbone. All areas must connect to it. Areas that connect between different uh, areas and area zero are called border routers and sometimes called backbone border routers. Um, but a border router or area border router is any router that is has interfaces in more than one area. And so it's considered to be in multiple areas. You can see here, here's an example of uh, that we're gonna use for this topology here. We've got uh, R1 through R6. We've got area zero, which is uh, an ethernet area right here. You've got area border routers between these areas. And you can just see that on the area border routers, the networks are associated with the particular area that they are part of, all right? So not anything really funky there, and we can all do that. Uh, the area ID, by the way, can be formatted as a simple decimal, zero through four million plus, or a dotted decimal. So the areas can be uh, done in different ways. So don't get confused if you see an area that is zero uh, or 255.252. Now, I don't know why you would do that, but if, maybe if you have a whole bunch of areas, um, that would be a way to do it uh, for simplicities. Um, but you can, um, the area advertises it in dotted decimal format. So even if you do it in uh, an integer or simple decimal, uh, it is always put into the OSP hello packet as a, as a dotted decimal. So intra-area and inter-area routes. So let's think about this. We've talked a little bit about types of LSAs. What is, if I go back over here to my whiteboard and let's talk about, if I have, what does an LSA type one have in it, folks? What are those? Anybody?
aren't these just link states? These are link states that are advertised by every router for every link that they have. So every link on a router, they will advertise an LSA type one. Now, type twos are a special type. They are used by DRs and BDRs, right? Everybody remember that? So basically, a if yeah. on a segment that has a DR BDR, they take the type ones that they receive from the routers that they have adjacencies with, reformat them as type twos and send them back out. And that's to keep everybody from having to have an adjacency with every other router in a uh, broadcast multi-access network. And what about our type threes? What are those? Anybody? Yeah. Those. These are between areas. So in other words, they take the type ones, format them into a type three and send them between areas. So type threes are used by area border routers to advertise routes between uh, the area and area zero, okay, and vice versa. So the type ones are converted to type threes and sent into the area. So when we look in here, as we look at these different routes, okay, intra area are within the area. So typically those will be type ones, type twos. And I know there's type fours, type fives, type sevens, type elevens, there's all kinds of types. Um, those aren't covered in this class. Basically, we've got to worry about types one, twos, and threes. But intra area type ones are for link states. Um, type twos are used by the border, uh, not the border routers, the designated router or backup designated router. And obviously, we would have that in this area because that is an Ethernet connection here. And so we can see the O, that is an intra area route. That is a route with yeah, your audio really cut to know. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I'll slow down. The O here is an intra area route inside of area one, two, three, four. So we can see that 10.3.3.0 slash 24 is intra area. And then the 10.45.1.0 is an inter area because it is from outside. So it's an OIA. That tells you it has been brought in typically with a type three LSA. And is, is that any better, Ollie? Is my video or my sound better? Yeah, it's sounding okay now the last minute. Okay. So OSPF inter-area routes, we can see them here. We can see their metrics, okay. You can also see the metric is drastically increased for um, compared to the 10.56.1, and that's because the 10.56.1 network, uh, the way it brings it in, it actually gives you the least cost um, that, that is associated with that route when it comes in. We'll talk more about that as we go forward. So let's look here. All right, so here's our type A's. Type 1, router LSA, advertise the LSA within an area. So this is our, what we call link. LSAs. Type two or network LSAs, they advertise a multi-access network segment on DRs. So basically the DR takes in all the type one LSAs and sends them back out as type twos. Type three is a summary LSA, which is used to advertise prefixes originating in a different area. So summary LSAs are used between areas. And then we got type four, type five, type seven, uh, we're not going to cover them in any detail, but um, a lot of times we'll see a type four. It's used by an autonomous system border router. So if you're injecting, if you're using the default information originate command to inject um, a, an external route into OSPF, it'll be seen as a ASBR. Or if you're injecting or, or uh, bringing in routes through route redistribution, you can see that as a type four. And then, excuse me. Type five would be the ones that are the redistributed. Type four would be um, if it's a summary uh, that's redistributed. So that's, that's again, 
not something that's even covered on this exam. It's something we cover in the next class. But there's even more folks because there's stubby areas and not so stubby areas um, that we'll talk about. But basically, the when you get into stubby areas, uh, you are getting into areas that only send their information, their route tables. Uh, well, they don't send their information out. They'll only receive information in uh, or vice versa. So there's, there's ways to do uh, all types of specialized areas. We're only going to talk about typical areas on a uh, OSPF network. So here we see our LSA types. We see the type that it is. So here's a router LSA, so it's type one. How the age, who advertised it, the sequence number associated with it. And here's the link ID. So this is telling you uh, what is being advertised. So here's our router link. So every router advertises a router link type one for all of its connected networks, okay? Now, those do not leave the area. They stay inside the area in which they are created. So other areas have no clue what's going on inside the area overall. They're, they're gonna get the summary LSAs that come out as type threes. Okay, so here's type two. This is where uh, you've had the DR, the DR takes in the type ones and then retransmits them as type twos. That is because you remember the way that the multi-access uh, broadcast works is that in this multi-access network, the routers don't form an adjacency with all the other routers. They only form an adjacency with the DR and BDR. So they'd actually don't see the type ones. The type ones go to the DR and BDR and then the uh, DR resends those out as type twos. Type threes are summary links. So what we do with them is the area border routers, in this case, R4 and R5, would take the type one LSAs and send them on as type three summaries LSAs. Now, the funny thing is we call them summary LSAs, but by default, they don't actually summarize. So if you have four networks inside of area one, two, three, four, those four networks, if they have type one LSAs, will be advertised as type three LSAs. We're going to talk about later how you can summarize those, or you may have already read about it, and if you have, then you know, but you can summarize those so that you don't send a single type three LSA for every network in the area but that's how these are used. They're used to take the type one LSAs, convert them to type threes and send those into other areas. So here's our summary. So the area border router, uh, the metric within the type LSA uses the following logic. Now this is it. If it is a type three created from a type one, it is the total path metric to reach the originating router in a type one LSA. Okay, so it'll take everything, the entire path. If it is created from a type L3 LSA from area zero, it is the total path metric to the ABR plus the metric in the original type three. So we see here, look at this R4. We're gonna look at R4. Type three LSA created by ABR5 here. The total path cost will be two because it's gonna take the cost that it was brought in at, in this case, area 56 brought it in as one, and also the path cost, um, to get to the ABR, which is one. So it would then take that and resend 56 with a metric of one into area one, two, three, four. Okay, which is weird, but it, it makes sense if you, if you look at it. And then we can see here, in this case, from R3's perspective, we look at R3, okay? It doesn't know exactly how far Okay, R3 doesn't know if 10561 is directly connected to the ABR4 or multiple hops away. But it knows that R4 is 65 and type 3 LSA has a metric of two, so the metric path to reach it is 67. So from an internal viewpoint, R3 believes it's 67 to reach 105612. R4 sees it as two away. So the type three created by ABR for 10156 internally, it uses the internal metrics. As it gets advertised externally, it uses the metrics that are, are provided to it from the ABR.
Now, <clears throat> this concept of areas, here's where we get in trouble. We get in trouble when we have discontiguous networks. If for some reason there is area zero is, is broken up or it's not contiguous, in other words, it's not one area, you get into all kinds of problems because here's what happens. When an area advertises its LSAs into area zero, it expects area zero to then advertise those again to any other attached ABRs. Well, that is why when we look at this, when area zero advertises a network to area 23, area 23 is not then gonna turn back around and advertise it again to area 12 and this other area zero because it learned it from area zero. So it expects that area 12 and area zero over here will already know about all the areas in area 34. So, that's why we don't want discontiguous networks. Now, there are ways around this, but just for, for general principle, don't make discontiguous networks. It's one of those things where they tell you that you can do it, but it's really not a good idea to do it, okay? Um, this happens occasionally because of hardware failures, um, and just we, we try to design our network so it doesn't happen. Now, like I said, you can fix it with a thing called a virtual link, you can actually sit here and you can make it appear that there's a virtual link so that area zero is connected, that those are all together. Um, but doing so is, is kind of a nightmare. So we try not to do that. Let's look at path selection. So we're gonna perform Dijkstra's shortest path first algorithm to create a loop free path. All routers use the same logic, which is lowest cost, and it prioritizes the logic by the following. So it's intra area, so within the area, obviously, between areas, and then external routes, which we're not going to cover the logic there because the external routes have, there's E1, E2 routes, there's all, there's all kind of external routes or intra area, and there's different routes we can use. But first, routes advertised as type 1 LSA are always preferred over type 3s. So if for some reason you're getting uh, a type one and a type three LSA for the same network, you're going to get um, the type one LSA is the preferred. So the metrics 111 and the inter area path selected over the inter area path with a lower metric. So even though there's a lower metric for a, an inter area path, the intra area path was selected because it has precedence. So if a route is a type one, it's picked first. Then we do inter area routes and equal costs. So the next one is, is it the lowest path metric to the destination? And if there's a tie, um, the routes will both can both be installed as long as they have equal cost multipathing. OSPF supports e equal cost multipath, God, I can't say that, equal cost multipathing for up to, by default, four paths. The key here is with OSPF, they must have equal cost. There's no method, like we know EIGRP can use the variance command to allow you to use unequal cost path, <clears throat> multipathing. Cannot do that with OSPF. It must be equal cost. There is a way to, um, I believe uh, the default is four, but I believe if I'm not mistaken, it can be bumped up to eight. Uh, as a max number of multipass for OSPF. If I'm wrong on that, anybody knows, tell me, but I think it is eight is the, the default. Now let's look at summarization. Now what, we put networks into multi areas for a simple reason. We want to make the LSDB smaller. We want to reduce the size of the LSDBs. Now, the problem is if you create multiple areas, you're still gonna have type three LSAs for all of the networks by default. So here, if we've got this topology, okay, so we got area zero and we got area one, two, three, four. There are three type one LSAs and one type two LSA in the 10, uh, 123.1.0 network. So this network right here, all right? Those four LSAs become one type three LSA outside the network because there's only one network here, the 123.1.0 slash 24. But if there were five networks inside of area one, two, three, four, 
there would still be five type three LSAs going into area zero. And then those would then be sent to any other area. Okay. So by default, you don't really have summarization. You have smaller type three LSAs being shared between areas. So in order to shrink the database, we want to summarize the networks inside of our areas. Now, this requires us to think about the design of our network. So folks, let's think about this. If we're building our networks, one of the things we're going to want to do is we're going to want to sit down and say, okay, so I'm gonna have a core, all right? And in that core, I'm gonna have, let's say these three routers. So this is gonna be, and they're all connected to a switch or high speed, however we're gonna do it. So there's area zero, all right? We're then going to take off of these area zero routers and we're gonna have other areas. So out here is another router. So let's go ahead and just dot, dot, dot area zero here. So here's area zero. So right here, we're also gonna have another area. This is gonna be, uh, remind me tomorrow. Okay. Let's have this be, uh, this is area 10. All right. And then let's go out here and here's another area. We're gonna have an area Let's just call it 192. Now I'm gonna make things really simple for us because I'm gonna state that inside of the core, everything in the core is 172.16.0.0 slash 16. So I made that, that design decision. Everything in area 10 is gonna be using some variation of 10.0.0.0 slash eight. And then here we're gonna use 192.168. Um, zero, zero slash 16. So when we design our network, we need to design it with summarization in, in, th in uh, as part of our thought process. So if we're looking here, you know, area 10 could have another 15 routers over here and it could consist of the network 10.1.0 um, slash 24, um, 10.1.2.0 slash 24, uh, 10.1.3.0 slash 24. And if we had those and we had no summarization, each one of those obviously are going to be advertised here as uh, type one LSAs. So router LSAs, type ones. Um, there would be, depending on the how the network's set up, there could be type twos. But all of these would then be sent back in here as type threes. Okay, they're gonna be type three LSAs that are getting sent. So Yes, it does help that when a route flaps here, we're not gonna have as fast of a reaction on the network. We don't have to recalculate the shortest path first inside of area zero, but we would still have all of those routes being sent in. It would be much better if we could just summarize and advertise only this one route as a type three LSA, type three LSA. And now we have a single route being advertised into the core and that route would then be sent as an L type three LSA here. Likewise, we could just send one back in here. So we're gonna summarize, but to do summarization, we need to design our networks from the beginning because guess what? If you come down here and as part of your network design, you had come in here and you made another area here and put 10.1.4.0 slash 24, and 10.1.5.0 slash 24, you could still summarize. You could still summarize zero to three up here, and then you know maybe another block, but you've not designed your network in a fashion to where the summarization would be the most efficient. Does this make sense? Because understanding summarization is great, how to do it, but a network that hasn't been designed for summarization from the beginning even if you know how to do it, it becomes much more difficult. Quick question for you. Let's say I did want to summarize 10.1.0.0, 10 10.1.1.0 slash 24, slash 24, 10.1.2.0 slash 24, and 10.1.3.0 slash 24. How would you summarize those? Somebody give me the process. Sorry, can you hear me now? 
Yang Hu. So for manual summarization, what I would do because the third octet is what's really different. Yep. Um, I would just simply I, I wouldn't put it in binary, but I would just simply look at the bits starting from the leftmost bit in the third octet to see which bits they have in common. And looking at the zero, one, two, three, they're only going to have two in common. So that means the first six bits in that um, third octet, they're going to have um, turned off. Correct. So we'll stop counting then. And then, of course, that will become our subnet mass, all the bits they have in common from the first, second, and then the six bits in the third octet. And then, of course, that'll be zeroed out. The last octet will be zeroed out. But that's how I teach manual summarization. That's exactly right. Now, what I actually do is I do convert it to binary. And then we just right. look right, yeah, we just look right here and we say, okay, so they match the first five bits match. Okay. So we know then that it's the summary for those is 10.1.0.0 slash. And then we back up five bits, right? We back up um, actually it's only yep. Oh, it should have been six bits. I think that last one you wrote is wrong. Yeah, oh, you're right. That is wrong. Yeah, Sorry. Last one. Six bits. So here, let me undo these. Undo that. My fault. Sorry, y'all. Binary RS011. Sorry. Yep, six bits. So what is our summary address then? It's 10.1.0.0 slash 22. 22. 20, correct. Yeah. 22. So that summarizes from the subnet zero to three. All right. Now, if we designed our network the way here and we had four down here, we would then have to figure out what other networks are up here, but that would still be a valid summary that we could send back as a type three LSA. But if I designed my network correctly, I would never put this down here. I would just have, have it to where I can easily summarize. So the other thing you could do if you do blocks, is put your blocks in in terms of um, bit ranges. So know that, you know, put 32 subnets here or 64 subnets here, 64 subnets here, so that you could do it that way. So design your networks around summarization and your life becomes much, much easier, okay? So here we are gonna look at this, summarizing the prefixes, that's exactly what I just talked to you about. But basically, we're looking at this network here. We've got 10, 1, 12, 10, 1, 24, 10, 1, 13, and 10, 1, 34. If you did not summarize this, you're going to have four different type 3 LSAs coming into area zero. So that's going to happen. Um, however, you could summarize it. So here they've gone in and summarized the 10, 1, 0, 0 slash 18. And that summary route is the only route being sent into area zero. So if this one network goes down, because you've got a summary, no recalculation has to take place in area zero. Because the summary route didn't go down, all these networks would have to go down for the summary route to go down. And so that protects area zero from route flapping in area one. Okay. So here we have intra area summarization where we're going in and summarizing the 172.16.10 all the way down. They've summarized it uh, to become 172.16.00 slash 20. Now, one of the key things about summarization is this, is you need to make absolutely sure that all the networks you summarize are actually in that area. Because if you do too broad of a summarization and that, those networks are not in that area, you can end up with massive routing issues because you can end up with uh, traffic being routed to an area and the network is not in that area and it's going to get black holed. In fact, when you summarize, okay, one of the things we do when we summarize, and the by default, by the way, when you do a summarization, it takes the uh, lowest metric and adds that in as the metric that's being that is given to the summarization um, that you create. You can change that. You can actually give it an actual value. OK, um, but if you you can actually configure that and make it change. What I want to show you, though, here, here is summarizing using changing the cost. So this says area 12 range 12, uh, 172, 16, 00, 255, 255, 00, cost 45. So that's going to summarize that range 
all of those would be advertised. You'll see here how we get a summarization route. On the area border router that is doing the summarization, you will also get a null route. Okay, so the ABR that's doing it puts this in. This is necessary in case traffic comes in for a um, network that is not currently in use, but is part of the summary route. So imagine right now the ABR can get to one, two, and three, but if a uh, packet came in for four, there's a possibility you could end up with a routing loop, but when you do summarization, it automatically puts in this null zero route, which is basically the bit bucket. And so if something for 172.16.4.0 slash 24 came in, it would come in here and it would hit the bit bucket. It would actually, it would go down and look um, and try to find a, uh, a better match, a longer match, but if it doesn't, it would then hit the bit bucket and go to null zero. All right. I got a question here. No, I was saying when I was reading this, I've never seen the null summary route for OSPF, only with ERGRP. So that was something I was looking for. Yeah, it does uh, happen. You summarize yeah. it, but it's automatically added. Just like is it, is it the manual summarization or the automatic summarization? Only with manual summarization. Okay. Yeah, with manual summarization. I've seen it. So yeah. Okay. Thank you. Right. Go ahead, somebody. No, I'm sorry, I said thank you. Oh, no problem. So let's look at route, fi uh, route filtering. One of the things we can do is we can control what routes come into and out of a network. The easiest way to do it is with this command right here, which is not advertise. So this basically says for this network, so we're gonna look at this, this is what we're looking at right here. These three networks, we don't wanna advertise for whatever reason, the two network into area zero. So on router two, we can put area 12 range um, this particular network not advertise, and then you will see on R3 that the 2.0 network is not sent as a type 3 LSA. So that basically prevents a type 3 LSA from being created for the two network. Um, so if you don't want a, that, a network advertised, that's the simplest way to do it is with the not advertise uh, area command. You also have the ability to create um, filters. You can actually do route filters. So there's a way to do um, route filtering uh, inbound and outbound. And the way we do this is with a thing called a prefix list. Now prefix list, important thing here to remember is the prefix list is like an access control list. By itself, a prefix list does nothing. It has to be applied to a filter list or uh, you can actually use pre, uh, prefix list with distribute list. That's kind of beyond the concept. Of, we do a little bit in here about distribute list, but uh, most of that's higher level concepts for OSPF. But with prefix list, you create it and you say what's permitted and denied. So in other words, we've got one here on R2. We're going to deny the one zero network uh, from coming in, from field coming into um, the R2's database. And so we're filtering that network, the one zero, and we're permitting everything else. So that would permit, in this case, all the networks except for one zero. So that prefix filter would come in, it would block it, it would not allow it to be placed in. So when we look at this local OSP of filtering, we receive an LSA from the neighbor. Typically, it will install the LSA into the LSDB, which it does. If it's got an inbound distribute list, it will either install that route into the rib or not. So with link state, you can actually go in and you can prevent it from being installed in that local rib with that with the distribute list. So that's a little different um, way to do it is to say, we don't want this list being placed into. So we can actually do a distribute list on R2 and block that network. And in this case, you'll see this, the difference is this. Filter list, keep it from being advertised. Distribute list, keep it from being installed in the local rib, the local routing information base. And you'll also notice that distribute list use um, access control list instead of prefix list. So we're basically saying here on R2, we're not going to allow on R2 um, the 3.0 network to be placed into the route table. But now it still goes to R3 because with the distribute list, we're not blocking it like we do with a filter list. We're only stopping it from going in the local database. So 
Let's go over this again. Filter list, prevent it from being advertised into other areas. Distribute list, keep it from being placed in the local routing information base. Oh, I dropped my pen. Okay. Now, as far as type fours, type fives, type sevens, all of that, don't worry about it. Not, not part of this exam. Um, the, what we just covered are the big things you need to know about um, OSPF's multi-area. All right. Well, folks, I'm going to call it a day because I know that was shorter and we didn't get to BGP, but we will get to BGP. Um, I do want to look at um, that next time. So that's on my list for our next item that we will do. Um, any questions? Yes, quick question. Um, when in, I haven't read the oh. BGP all just yet. Are yep. we going to focus um, on, sorry about that. Okay, I got to figure out. Are we going to focus I on both my... the I and the EBGP or just um, the internal, I'm sorry, the external BGP? EBGP is, tip, is what we're looking at mainly here. Yeah, because I remember we had this before, so I had the notes yep. for that, so I didn't know if I needed to go yeah. study IBGP. Well, um, I, IBGP uh, is, is, is important, and it is something we're going to, to talk about. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I do believe this particular uh, part of the course focuses mainly on EBGP. Um, and then IBGP we'll talk more about uh, later as we get into, into the other class. Okay. No Let problems. me make sure that though. I can actually check on our, let's pull our. Yes. One of the lab that I did, it was EBGP. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it is, it is EBGP. I don't think. And if we look here, uh, I'm going back to look at my, my thing. I'm pretty sure that our blueprint says uh, EBGP only. Because when you get into IBGP, it really starts getting uh, extremely, extremely uh, detailed because you've got so much control. Should be right. Oh, yes. It's at the bottom. It said EBGP. Oh, sorry. No, I just saw it. Okay. Yeah, it's EBGP. Okay, well, that'll be fine on that one. Okay. Yeah, and there's automation and all, but let me go back over here. I got to find my, there it is. Configure and verify EBGP connection between the connected neighbors. So we don't get into, with IBGP, you have to get into how the routes from a, um, from an interior gateway protocol are brought into BGP. Um, I will tell you folks, just as a, a, a quick start on BGP, the, the, the thing about BGP that is so weird is that typically all routing protocols that we've dealt with to this point, if you didn't have a physical link on that network, okay, or, well, basically, if you didn't have a physical link or a path to that network in some form or fashion, you would not, you would not put it in the route table or you would not advertise it. BGP gives you so much control that it will allow you to advertise networks that you even don't really have a path for, assuming that the interior gateway protocol will have a path for it. The problem is, with, as we've said, with great power comes great responsibility. BGP gives you the power to do all types of control of how traffic moves in your network, but it also allows you to majorly mess that up. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's scary. It's it's a scary protocol simply because, you know, in its simplest form, it's it's not hard to set up. I call it the coffee cup protocol because you configure it, make a change, go get your cup of coffee, and come back. Then the change will have taken effect because it's not a very fast protocol in my experience. But it's so configurable that you can really you can control exactly how traffic moves in a network. But you can also do that to the detriment of your network. Um, there have been cases of people accidentally through BGP routing all traffic on the internet through their networks. Um, and so that that would be very bad. Um, and so it's it's a it's a protocol that's it's interesting. It's it's a fun protocol, but it's also one that you've really got to know your stuff and in the real world out in ISPs, uh, usually the people who are doing BGP configurations 
are your your highest level network technicians or network engineers um, simply because it is so dangerous um, and it, it deals with the the external connection of the network to um, the internet so but we'll go over more of that next week so all right Perfect. all right folks well thank you very much well, let me end one question go ahead, go ahead. Um, I know that next week is Cisco Live. I have not looked at the schedule. Oh, but yeah, it is. Next week, but next week Thursday is still one of the days there. I was, I don't know if it's overlapping with the with time when we would be online here. Have you looked at the schedule? I have not. I thought. Um, I think Tuesday, Wednesday is the. I, for some reason, I was thinking Tuesday, Wednesday was a Cisco Live. Um, yes, that's correct. Yeah, I think it's Tuesday, Wednesday. Okay. Tuesday, Wednesday. Oh, oh, I think so we're okay. Thursday. Oh, okay. Thursday's on there, but I think the majority of uh, the majority of all the things I have seen were on Tuesday and Wednesday. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Uh, man, I so I so wish we were all in person at Cisco Live. Golly, I miss I miss Cisco Live. That's my that's my favorite conference. Mm -hmm. Okay, folks. I'm